So what I thought I'd do is I try to, well, actually the whole session is now going from, you know, the local responses into more systemic responses. And <clears throat> I will, the main focus will be on a series of observations that would suggest that gut microbiota actually impact on uh, brain development and brain function. But I would like to make some points before coming into this topic. So the, the view we hold in the lab is that you have a genetic setup. And um, that together with nutrients and uh, gut microbiota may set physiological parameters. And, and I agree with Tom that the word homeostasis is, can be used very incorrectly, but if one tries to define it, it can actually also mean something. Because homeostasis can also mean health. But if you start to look into the word health, does it mean presence of disease? Does it mean absence of disease? Can there be so that you have local activity somewhere in the body, but you still are healthy? And these are definitions that we are far from um, have a coherent grip on. But suffice to say that one of the key environmental cues that is involved in the parameters that we refer to as health or homeostasis is definitely the gut microbiota. The second point uh, that we've been doing for a number of years is that we have this idea that the second messengers from incoming signals that actually transmit from the gut microbiota are targeted through the, some of the nuclear receptors. And of course, if this hypothesis is correct, it doesn't take Einstein to realize that you then have an interception across to literally every function in the body, depending then on which nuclear receptor that you target. And if this works out, as in most of our cases, you basically come into normal physiological programming and you develop in an adult and you die hopefully in peace. But sometimes there are problems because there are some SNPs or there are changes in the diet or a lot of other stress parameters that may actually alter this developmental programming and that will impact on the gut microbiota. And to this we know very little about because most of the studies is in adults. But then, in many cases, the lifestyle-related disease, you come up with a chronic inflammation. And there are a number of examples published suggesting that there is a contribution to the gut microbiota. And I suspect we will hear quite a lot about that in the subsequent sessions. <clears throat> the toolbox that we use as we heard quite nicely from uh, McPherson yesterday, of the germ-free mice, and, and Tom quite nicely highlighted his knowledge about this. But this is just another point that I want to bring forward, and that is germ-free mice actually live much longer than normal mice. And that raises a whole series of fundamental questions. How do you set about to control life expectancy? And you can then use the germ-free as an artificial tool to ask questions related to that. So let me give an example. We started to do systematic expression arrays in 2005 in collaboration with the Genome Institute in Singapore. And one of the target organs that we were interested in was the liver. And here you see a validation of expression arrays and out comes a whole series of genes that is connected to drug metabolism, lipid metabolism, and molecular transport. And the one that struck us there was the nuclear receptor car. So we did a simple experiment where we asked the question, how long will the mice sleep? And we injected barbiturates. And on the left side, you see germ-free mice that sleep approximately 50 minutes, as opposed to the mice being exposed to bacteria, they sleep approximately 30 minutes. So it implies that one of the aspects of the gut microbiota in liver is actually to start to tune the xenobiotic metabolism. And we are not the only one to publish this. I think there was a paper from Jeremy Nicholson uh, already a year before us on this subject. But what does that mean? 
Well, we know that if you have high levels of xenobiotic metabolism, you have longevity. And the point that I'm putting up here before I come in sort of to the, the brain stuff is when you start the postnatal colonization, what are you activating in terms of the regulation of xenobiotic metabolism? Is it there just to reduce um, free radicals, or is it the time when the clock starts to tick? That's I just want to convey as a thought. Now, the postnatal um, transition is, um, as we heard, the, the time when you start to colonize bacteria. But from the newborn perspective, or the newborn organism, it's a dramatic change, both in terms of nutritional intake and you have to start to breed. And that transition is, is a, have a huge impact on a many different parameters. Because essentially, when you are in, the, in utero, then you are essentially a parasite, because everything is supplied by the mother. And you know, a lot, lot of the things that we call essential amino acids is not really an issue because it's provided to them during the, uh, due to the umbilical cord. Once you're born, this clips off and you have to start then to take in nutrients um, yourself. And if you don't take into nutrients, you will die. This is also a step when the meaning of an essential amino acid becomes important. And the reason I'm rabbiting on about this is because it makes a point for what I'm going to talk about. Because tryptophan is one of these amino acids. Now, tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. But tryptophan is also cleaved and metabolized by a series of microbiota. And some of the metabolites they derive to are planar indoles, which binds to another type of nuclear receptor, uh, which is called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. So it's almost like you have a developmental conditional control to activate ligands for a set of uh, receptors typified by the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. <clears throat> so coming then into um, the observations that would suggest that the microbiome have an impact on brain function. This is just a cartoon showing that there are electric signals from the nervous system that transmit into the endocrine system. You generate hormones, and that will have effects into organ systems. And hormones are secreted molecules, and many of them bind to nuclear receptors. We also know from quite nice work from Dushman and Tracy that there is a nervous outflow that affects the enteric microflora. And um, that was one of the reasons that I really got interested into this. And uh, there is also an array of papers suggesting that you have various peptides released from their various microbiota that would bind to enteric uh, neuronal receptors and subsequent execute functions. Some of them are more convincing, some are less convincing. But suffice to say that there are a number of molecules to be identified that may actually impact on the nervous signaling system. And, and with these two observations in mind, and with this um, slide of data that will be the only unpublished slide that I will show, because this was the one that led us into the idea that maybe bac bacteria may control brain function. So this is an expression array from the colon, and these are germ-free mice, these are SPF mice. And the, the enzyme is called TDO2, and there are two enzymes that regulate um, um, tryptophan. It's the TDO2 and it's the IDO. And the IDO is well reported with its effect to the immune, immune function on T cells. But TDO2 has been reported in the liver, but it was not reported in the um, gut. And that led us then to say, well, if bacteria can upregulate an enzyme so profoundly, as you can see here, maybe there's a link. So we started to look in the literature, and indeed there were some old reports saying that when you colonize germ-free mice, you release serotonin from uh, the colon. And <clears throat> at this stage, uh, I approached uh, 
the director of the Stockholm Brain Institute who guided me to a very talented neurobiologist who sort of helped us to do this experiments and actually design the um, uh, behavioral tasks to address the question, can we change uh, behavior by simply playing around with the microbiota? And what you see here is uh, locomotion studies, and you just video record and you let the computer assemble uh, how it moves. And you can see here in the SPF mice that there's a lot of activity in the early phase. As you project a long time, they slow down and some animals actually fall asleep. In contrast, the germ-free mice, they just go on and on and on and actually do not slow down. The interesting point with was, was that if we um, expose microbiota very early in life, so these are adult SPF and adult germ-free mice, if we now give microbiota very early in life, actually we gave the microbiota prior to mating, and we can discuss why we did this later on. Then you can see that you can revert the phenotype. If you do the same thing in adult mice, you can see that now you cannot revert the behavior. So they maintain the hyperactivity, almost implying that um, the phenomena that we have in terms of hyperactivity is something which is set early in life. And this is another way of displaying it. And you can see here that this is the novel environment study. And then the two groups of mice almost looks identical. Then the germ-free mice continue to be active, whereas the SPF mice slow down. The second type of experiment was to look for <clears throat> how they would behave in an open field test, which is a way of monitoring risk-taking behavior or anxiety. This is usually where there sometimes is a problem with the movie. But you can see the fellow here. So these are the mice which are exposed to bacteria. And this is a typical behavior. They go out and you can monitor all the time points they do like this. They try to stand in the locked arm because they feel secure and this is one meter height. Uh, and they do not go out here. Now you have the same mouse, but it's not exposed to bacteria. That's the fellow. And you can see that this one just completely disobeyed the behavior of being afraid. And it sort of have a, it's actually very curious and exploring. And again, this is something that you can revert uh, by exposing uh, in um, early life. And we also done what is called a light dark box test, but I've not had time to show that, but it is published, you can have a look. But the bottom line is that mice which have not been exposed to bacteria, they stay much more in the light box as opposed to the dark box, almost disobeying the traditional rules of being afraid. So we have then three sets of observations in terms of locomotion, the light dark box test and the elevated plus test to suggest that germ-free mice have a different behavior compared to mice that have been exposed to bacteria. What are then the underlying molecular mechanisms? And I cannot give you that. I can give you a series of correlations uh, one of the first things we did was to connect some of the neurotransmitter growth factors that is involved in the programming of the phenomena that we've seen in terms of the behavioral tasks. And this is the BDNF and the NGF1A, which are very much involved in the phenomena that I'm uh, described to you. And we did in situ hybridization, and you can see here that there is a massive upregulation of uh, the <clears throat> BDNF and also in the NGF1A. And we did this in various different compartments. So again, there's a correlation between upregulation of factors that is involved in the brain development and the colonization of bacteria. 
<clears throat> I think we can skip this one. So having now a set of observations on change of behavior, we had factors connecting to the development of the brain function and maintenance of uh, cell fate of neurons. We then apply the expression arrays, and you see here five different regions, the hippocampus, cerebellum, cortex, hypothalamus, and the striatum. And then you give this to the uh, bio, bioinformaticians, and out comes then four canonical pathways that would surface every time we would um, expose uh, mice to, bac to bacteria. And this, the green one means lower expression compared to germ-free mice, and each lane represents one mouse. <clears throat> and again, the two canonical pathways that we paid attention to was the synaptic long term termination and cyclic MP signaling. And coming back then from the point of view that we had the observation of possible regulation of serotonin connecting into the synaptic long term potentiation, we then you look in the literature and then you find well, these are the dopamine pathways and these are the serotonin pathways. Essentially now you go into fundamental biological aspects of life, which is mood, memory processing, memory processing, sleep, uh, cognition, and reward, pleasure, motor function, etc. And uh, the way the brain usually transmits information is to utilize neurotransmitters like, for example, the uh, serotonin. And there's a group called the uh, monoamines, and there you have, for example, the dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and serotonin. And they modulate a widespread of activities in the brain across uh, different uh, functionalities. <clears throat> and again, you know, the, the, the most well-studied uh, neurotransmitters are the serotonin and dopamine, and having this observation that we may subject to regulation to this neurotransmitted in terms of bacteria, that would mean we would just have a connection to every aspect of normal life. And this was then confirmed, but this gave us sort of a slight surprise, so we took the five different regions, made tissue extract, and then monitor metabolites. And what you can see here is the, um, the metabolites for dopamine, serotonin, and uh, noradrenaline. And we actually, when you start to, to colonize the bacteria, you can see that the, um, the number of metabolites, so this is actually the number of metabolites. And as you see then, there is a decrease of metabolites, implying that the bacteria stabilize the neurotransmitters. The surprising finding was that we could only observe this in the striatum. So the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, cerebellum was completely unaffected. And we have no idea why the microbiota would target the striatum. Um, another correlation would be to look into a uh, level of synapse activity or quantify indirectly the level of synapses. And that you can do by monitoring protein like the synaptophysin and the PSD95. So we did Western blots on this. And here again, you can see this is the frontal cortex, this is the striatum, and this is the hippocampus. So these are the germ-free mice, these are the SPF mice, and these are the conventionalized mice. So again, when I talk about conventional mice, we colonize at birth or very early in life, let them grow to adulthood, and then we do the Western blots. And the PSD95 is a scaffold protein that can modulate dopamine 1D receptors in inhibiting dopamine 1 signaling, suggesting that this may be part of the explanation of the altered locomotion activity that we observed. And the other protein was uh, synaptophysin. And again, you see here the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and then this is the SPF, and this is the conventionalized. And we've done densitometry on this one, and you can see in the paper that there is a statistical significance. So again, this modulation of synapse activity, if, if, if you would accept that view, 
that seems to be only present in the striatum in the five compartments that we looked at. Now, <clears throat> the synaptophysin has sort of an interesting twist, and that is it connects to a protein called synaptobrevin. And for uh, anyone who's a microbiologist, and I'm not a microbiologist, so I go on thin ice now, but synaptophysin docked to synaptobrevin. But synaptobrevin is well known because that's the target for neurotoxins. And they cleave synaptobrevin, and that causes some of the problems related to tetanus. And the way these um, toxins migrate is by retrograde transport into the executive area of the brain. <clears throat> so one, well, the first level of um, speculation would come here. Is it so then that when we, the humans or the mammals started to be colonized by uh, bacteria, the first one or part of the first one to come in, were actually the one that you know, happened to kill the individual. But as you then gradually started to adapt, you were then selected for additional bacteria with similar type of molecules that would not kill but perhaps attenuate. Or in light of where I started, that they actually contribute to the development of brain function. And so this would then be a possible route for some of the hormones that may be secreted by the bacteria reaching the brain uh, without having to deal with the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> um, another point which is implied in the Western blood data is that the microbiota actually modulate synapse function. And we know that very early in life there is a massive drop in the number of synapses, and there are indirect measurements, uh, indirect indications to suggest that TNF alpha and the complement factor C1Q actually plays an important role in this. This is done by other people and in other um, model systems. The retrograde transport I have sort of uh, indicated to you. The third one is that there are, as I alluded to in the beginning, there are secretory uh, molecules that mimic some neural peptides, which then binds to receptor that may even facilitate a normal um, neuronal circuit that is scattered along the intestinal canal. <clears throat> so this is just a summary of where we stand, that we have sort of a given data that we target the growth factor, we seem to target synaptic plasticity in certain compartments, and definitely diet and the composition of the microbiota, of course, will have an impact on this, but we don't have the data. The other one is, of course, that there are a series of metabolites that may have an impact on chromatin function, suggesting that there are levels of epigenetic regulation. And the, the final point I just want to finish off with is, and that makes then it it's sort of quite interesting, because we know that many of the lifestyle-related disease are perhaps not so much genetics. Genetics contribute, but clearly there are environmental cues. And in terms of neurodegenerative diseases, there is a lot of um, precursor activity, and it actually takes quite a long time until you go into the full disease condition. So there is room for intervention once we would have a grip on where to intercept. And um, this is an old cartoon taken uh, from my time at the medic, where you basically have these characters, the sanguine, the phlegmatic, the melancholic, and the choleric. So maybe as we go along in the next couple of years, we will start to subclassify depending on the microbiome. So the point and the work carried out here is, and I would underline and stress again, the very, very talented neurobiologist Rochelle, who helped me immensely 
and Hans for introducing me to Rutellis. Farana made all the Western blots. Shigui Wang did all the expression arrays together with uh, Martin Hibbert. And the work on the um, uh, xenobiotic metallicies, Gaysen Arlampalam, Linda Aronson, um, and that's it. And I stop here and take questions.